How's it going? Uh, my name is Daniel, and I'm with Renew.org, and it's great to be with you. I'm actually, uh, I live up there in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Ever, anybody ever been to Cedar Rapids? Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's a good place, yeah. So, um, I've been cheering on the suns, though. Anybody been cheering on the suns? Raise your hand. Yeah. Aren't they amazing? Uh, yeah, they haven't been to the finals since, I think, 1993 against the Bulls. Was anybody around back then? They were cheering on the Suns, wasn't it? Yeah, this is, this is a good deal. Yeah, yep. Good stuff. Okay, so, uh, again, it's really good to be here with you. I'm talking today about a thing called tolerance. We're going to get to that in, in just a second, but I just, uh, I've got some books I want to give away, because uh, that's, that's always fun, so I need to come up with a way of giving it away. So uh, here's, my, here's my first question. Um, the founder of Jainism. There's a book on world religions here. So anybody know the founder of Jainism? The, it's, a, it's a religion. It's called Jainism. Who Just throw something out. Who's got Jain? And that is incorrect. So that means you need the book. So here's the book. Okay. Yeah. There you go. It'll tell you all about it. Okay, uh, this is a book called Mirage. This one's kind of a fun one. It's a humorous one. The first uh, story in it has me killing what kind of animal? Just throw something out. Okay, okay, pause. Start, starts, with a, starts with a T. I'm going to have to call on you because I'm hearing so much. Starts with a T? Wait, wait, wait. Someone said turtle. Who said turtle? Was that you? Here you go, man. Yeah. I'm not proud of it, but it, it does, it did happen. So, oh man, okay, uh, we got one more World Religions book, one more Mirage. So, uh, let's say World Religions, I don't know. Um, okay, uh, Buddhism comes from India. Uh, Hinduism comes from India. Uh, Jainism comes from India. What's the other religion that comes from India? Wait, 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 who says Sikh- Sikhism? Back there? All right, can you, can you come get it? It'll be all right. Way to go, man. Um, okay. And, uh, yeah, man. Okay, that's one I edited. Uh, there's a lot of really great scholars that, that uh, put that together. And, by the way, there's a lot of great resources at renew.org. Obviously, you can go to the website, renew.org. I'm the editor for Renew. We've got a lot of Ronnie, who you just heard. Uh, he, he spoke. Or, I'm sorry, he, uh, he uh, writes for Renew. Carrie writes for Renew, wherever Carrie's at. Uh, so check out renew.org, check out our table. Here's one more book. Uh, who came from the farthest? Raise your hand if you, you came from like eight hours away. Seven hours away. Six hours away. Okay, where are you guys? Wisconsin? Tulsa, okay. Uh, here, here I, uh, yeah, I'll, I'm gonna, wh- whoever catches it. Okay, all right, good. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and pray. And uh, we'll talk about tolerance. So let's pray. God, thank you so much for everybody in this room. I pray that what uh, we talk about today would be helpful. I pray that you'd give us something uh, to kind of go home with, thinking about and resolving to do. Um, and uh, maybe, you know, I, we, we, could, we could talk about it in such a way that doesn't just impact our minds, but also uh, influences our hearts and eventually uh, affects what we do. So we love you, Lord. We thank you. And thank you so much for this conference so far. It's been so helpful, um, you know, to talk about pride. And, uh, you know, so we just want to acknowledge um, at the outset here is that we are, we are not God. You are God, and we are your children. We're the sheep of your pasture. And so lead us. I pray that you'd, you'd lead us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, so in this workshop class thing, we're going to look at the topic of sin. And we're going to ask a very important question about sin, and that is, how should we feel about it? Um, should we feel, and, what, and the word is, is tolerance, uh, should we feel tolerant towards sin? And I think most of us are probably pretty aware that we've, we, that's not the right attitude towards sin. You know, we shouldn't feel this you know, tolerance. However, how can you not be tolerant and, and not turn into a jerk? Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty important question as well. So we're going to talk about that. In, in fact, in this class, we're going to talk about two things. The first thing is we're going to look at four righteous responses to sin. And they'll be good to write down. 
Uh, but that, that's kind of like the big picture, the four righteous responses to sin. Um, how should we respond to it? There's four righteous ways. Um, although what we're going to see is that not all of those four ways are actually our job as humans. Okay. Secondly, we're going to zoom in and we're going to look at, look at one of the biggest temptations we are going to face when it comes to the sins in our culture. Okay, one of the biggest, biggest temptations we're going to face, and that is the question of, am I going to be a truth teller when it comes to these sins, or am I going to try to keep cultural power? That's going to be the big decision. So again, um, we're going to look at four righteous responses to sin. We're going to look at which ones are our job. And secondly, we're going to look at one of the biggest temptations we're going to face when it comes to sin. Uh, you know, Are we going to be a truth teller, or are we going to be someone who craves cultural power, cultural influence. Um, so, four righteous responses to sin. The Bible describes these four righteous responses to sin. Again, not all of them are our job description. Here's the first one. It starts with an H. We are to feel what towards sin? Anybody want to shout it out? It starts with an H. Hatred. That's exactly right. Yeah. Sounds a bit harsh, uh, but, but that's kind of the most basic feeling we should have towards sin. Um, so I, I live in uh, Iowa now. I mentioned that. I used to live in Kansas. I know, not too many people know this about me, but I'm actually the guy that wrote the pledge to the Kansas flag. Um, nobody's ever heard the pledge to the Kansas flag, but I wrote it. And, uh, and here it goes. I pledge allegiance to the Kansas flag. Yeah. Uh, and, and, yeah, thank you. And, and to, uh, to this flatness on which we stand... One mountain, under three feet, every 200 miles, with grass and dirt for all, okay? So, so I'm from Kansas, and I uh, moved to Iowa, really like Iowa, but the winters are insane. I was talking with, uh, what's your name? Lynn. Everybody needs to know Lynn. Lynn's awesome. Lynn's the guy who started CMU, am I right? And what's that? You and Wes. Okay, Wes is awesome, too. So... Um, so anyway, he was telling me there's a guy he knows who was up in Iowa who during winter, he's taking a walk, took a breath and he died. Um, yeah, so that's the winters up there. So I go up there my first winter there and I'm from Kansas. I, uh, that was a terrible story, wasn't it? Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, uh, go through my first winter there and uh, <laughs> I write a poem, uh, and the poem goes like this. There's a crazy, stupid blizzard going on outside my door. It's a crazy, stupid blizzard that I ever seen before. And that's the poem. Uh, but at, yeah, thank you. Uh, but, but as, okay, it's not quite as good as the spoken word stuff that's been going on up here. But hasn't, hasn't that been awesome? That has been so amazing. Um, so anyway, the point is, now that I've been up in Iowa for a little while, I'm starting to get used to the winters. When, objectively speaking, those winters are wrong. Like, they are objectively wrong, and you should never get used to them. It's the same with sin. We are very tempted to just get used to it. It's like, whatever, not a big deal. No, objectively speaking, these are, this is wrong. Okay, and that's, and that's why the first righteous response is what towards sin? Hatred, thank you. Um, it's a built-in aversion to sin. It's always present. It's always there for, as disciples of Jesus. Why do we always hate sin? Well, it's because we love God and we love people. It's that simple. Since our love is genuine, then we genuinely hate whatever is going to destroy whatever we love. So we hate evil. Uh, Psalm uh, 97 verse 10, Psalm 97 verse 10 says, Oh, you who love the Lord hate evil. Uh, 1 Peter 2 verse 11 says, Dear friends, now listen to the language here. I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, which, now again, these are the sinful desires, abstain from them, which wage war against your soul. Your sinful desires are not you. They aren't your identity. Rather, what do they do to you? What did it say? They wage what? They wage war against your soul. You've got to be able to know the difference. Just like a doctor knows the difference between the body he's trying to save and the cancer he's trying to destroy. If you love a person, you've got to know who's the person and what is the part that's going to kill that person. So Romans 12 verse 9, I mentioned this yesterday in the class, but Romans 12 verse 9 says, Love must be sincere. Uh, and how do you know that your love is sincere? It says, Love must be sincere. 
hate what is evil, cling to what is good. So love must be what? Sincere. How? How do we make it where our, li- our love isn't like an act, and we're not just acting when we say we love people? Two ways, if you say you love someone, but you don't hate what destroys that person, and you don't cling to what is good in that person, then your love is just a sham, okay? So love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. The hatred against evil is just always there for a disciple of Jesus. Here's the second response, second righteous response to, uh, to evil. Search with a G is something we feel deeply when we see it happen. Search with a G-R. Grief, that's exactly right. Um, what happens... So we always have this hatred toward evil. Like we hate it because it destroys what we love. Uh, but whenever we see evil happen, uh, how do, what do we feel? We feel grief over it. Um, this, is, this is true when it comes to sins that I commit. I should feel this grief. Here's uh, Joel, Joel chapter 2, verse 12 says this, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, With, and then he says, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, okay? It's it's this grief over sin. And since we love others, then it it grieves us to see them hurt themselves with sin. So that's the second righteous response is is to feel grief. Like, man, I'm so sad that this has happened. Uh, The third response, third righteous response uh, to evil is, it starts with an A. We feel it a lot whenever we look at the news, A. Anger, you got it, anger because of evil. So number three is anger because of evil. Now, here's the deal. Whereas evil and grief over evil, I'm sorry, uh, hatred, hatred to evil, number one, and grief over evil, they always get the green light, okay? Bible always gives us a green light. You should always feel hatred to evil against evil. You should always uh, feel grief whenever you see it. Number three does not get a green light. Number three gets a... Close, a yellow light, that's right, and sometimes a red light. You know, it, um, the idea is that the wise person, this is Proverbs 12, verse 16, the wise person is slow to anger. If you do get angry, which we do, but if you do get angry, you've got to make doubly sure that you don't let any sin grow uh, in, in its overflow. You know, the uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And then Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 says this. Let all, and listen to this list. It says, let all uh, uh, anger, I'm sorry, uh, bitterness, let all bitterness and wrath and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Yeah. Here's the deal with me at least, and maybe with you as well, but man, it is rare that I can handle anger without becoming part of the problem. Like if I go ahead and say, all right, I'm going to get angry, and I go ahead and go there, I usually almost always become part of the problem. Um, so definitely a yellow light, sometimes even a red light uh, on that one. Anger because of evil. And number four. The fourth one always gets the red light for us. We should never do this one. It's called, starts with the WR. Wrath, very good, wrath. Uh, Romans 12, verse 17 and, and 19 says, never, how often is that? Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Again, that's Romans 12, verse 17 and 19. So what is our job description? When it comes to an enemy of ours, same chapter, Romans chapter 12, what do we do when there, when there is somebody that we really feel like taking wrath out on? Our job as disciples of Jesus is to figure out ways to bless our enemy. Um, it says in Romans 12, you know, give them food, give them drink when they're hungry, when they're thirsty. That's our job. Our job is never to take out wrath rarely to get angry, always, what are the two things that we always get the green light for? Number one, hate evil. Number two, feel what over it? Grief. You got it. Now, what's interesting about um, anger and wrath is it's not always a green light for God either. 
In fact, with God, it's almost always a yellow light. Um, Psalm chapter 103, verse 8 says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, means full of grace. And then it says, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. Um, so he's slow to anger. And, and when it comes to wrath, even his wrath follows warning after warning after warning. God has an incredible amount of patience, which I'm really grateful for. Jeremiah 44, verse 4 to 6, God says this, But I, I persistently sent to you all of my servants, the prophets, saying, Oh, do not do this abomination that I hate. But they did not listen. Therefore, my wrath and my anger were poured out. And all the while, his, God's anger, God's wrath stay anchored in grief. Second uh, Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, he is, God is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Okay? So what are the four righteous responses to evil? Number one, uh, go ahead and say it. Number one is hatred toward evil. And that's just always there for a disciple of Jesus. You hate that which destroys what you love. Number two is what? Yeah, grief over. When you see it, it's like, man, that's really heartbreaking when it's in you or when it's in somebody else. Number three, yellow light, sometimes red light is what? Anger towards sin. And then finally, number four, we always get the red light on this one. This is only God. And, and he even gives himself the yellow light on this one. And it is number four, wrath. You got it. So do you see how understanding those four steps can help you to hate sin, like, like legitimately hate it, without turning into a jerk? You see how that works? Um, and, and then when, when you see, um, you know, you see sin, we, we so typically, we see something bad, we jump straight to number three. Sometimes straight to number four. But we, we, we just so easy to be like, angry because it like we, we feel hurt or something like they've hurt us it's so much better when you see that sin don't jump to anger go to what what what, what starts with the g go to the grief does that make sense how, how that works um okay so again in this class we want to do two things number one look at four righteous responses to sin and then number two kind of zoom in on one of the biggest temptations that you're going to face when it comes to sin in our culture and that is you're going to need to figure out am I going to be a truth teller when it comes to sin or am I going to kind of keep quiet about sin maybe even change my mind about what sin is so that I can keep cultural power okay that's where we're going now uh, so what are some sins out there that uh, our culture our current western culture wants us as Christians to stay silent about, or maybe even change our mind about? What are some of those sins um, that culture wants us to really tone down and reverse our approach on? Shout them out. Go ahead. Homosexuality, absolutely. Yep. Gender identity. Yep. Yep. What are some more? There, there are more. I mean, those are, those are really good answers. Those are very, very relevant. But uh, what are some other ones? Do you say sexual immorality? Anything sexual. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. We're, we're getting to where, I mean, honestly, there's a flag for everything. Uh, in any uh, imaginable type of sexuality. And every, every time there's a flag, it's like that's meant to be waved and celebrated. And so any kind of sexual immorality. We're, we're actually getting to the point where sexual immorality, like the culture wouldn't even recognize that as a thing. If it's your sexual identity, it couldn't be immorality. So, yeah, very good. What's another thing? Sorry? Drunkenness. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, witchcraft? That's a big one, isn't it? Who said that? Yeah, smoking weed? Absolutely. You know, witchcraft has actually kind of become a cool thing, whereas going to church has become kind of a not cool thing. Uh, you know, Wicca, and, uh, you know, is actually kind of on the rise. So, yeah, good. What's another one? I'm thinking of one that's... Uh, Man, it's, it's huge. Uh, it starts with an A. It's kind of a Bible word, A-P-O, A-P-O-S. Someone said it. Yeah, apostasy, the idea of leaving your faith. Um, biblically, that's a, that's a really bad thing. Like, that's a really dangerous thing. Culturally, that, that becomes seen as something that's actually kind of, um, you know, liberating. 
um, actually kind of a good thing because you're being true to you. Um, so anyway, yeah, those are that's a great list of, of sins that our culture wants us to keep quiet about and even change our mind about. So what's the choice? As Christian leaders, uh, the choice is, am I going to tell the truth about this? Now, obviously, tell the truth lovingly, gently, um, in a way that uh, you're not you're not trying to be provocative. You're not trying to be antagonistic. I mean, you're, you're, you're telling it humbly, but you're still telling the truth, okay? The choice between that or I'm just going to keep quiet about it, maybe even change my mind about it being a sin so that I can keep cultural power. Okay, that's our, that's our question here. And I want to delve into this question, uh, and I want to do it by using my imagination. So this is going to be the long answer, but I hope it's helpful. Um, are we going to be tellers of truth or are we going to be lovers of power? That's, that's our central question, okay? So here's the long answer. What I'm going to share are my imaginings of what might have happened. Again, just my imagination here, but um, a long time ago, after the great war in heaven, after the angel Satan's rebellion against God, Satan and his demons were cast to the earth, sulking and cursing and licking their wounds they had lost. But Satan wasn't done. His anger rising, his contorted face twisting in a hateful, grimacing grin. This is only the beginning, he promised. True, they would no longer be able to plan a direct assault against heaven, but that was okay. They would simply redirect their evil efforts down here. After all, this place, earth, was the site of God's special attention. God had created this beautiful planet, and then he placed in charge as kind of like a steward over his creation, intelligent bipeds called humans. God had created humans with himself in mind. Uh, As he had put it, he had created them in his image. And since it was obvious that God loved these humans. It was obvious to Satan what his new strategy was going to be. You see, if Satan Satan and his demons were able to somehow hurt humans, wound them, even curse them, even better yet, get them to curse God, well, then Satan would be hurting, wounding, punishing God, and it'd be revenge. Hurt humans, you hurt God. But then, of course, the next question is not quite so simple, and that's the question of how how, how do we attack these humans so as to cause the most imaginable pain to God? And it's a little bit like those you know, carnival high striker strength tester games uh, where you hit the hammer down as hard as you can uh, at the bottom of it with the hopes that the after effect rises all the way to the top of the tower, goes ding. Uh, I've never done it. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Okay, okay, good. Right. Uh, so anyway, Satan asks himself, how can we like strike hard enough down here to where the pain reaches as high as God himself. So, although Satan's pride usually meant that he didn't ask for any help, uh, the question of how was just so pressing that Satan called a meeting of all of his demons. My fellow demons, as we have learned, God is impossible to beat. To this came hisses and curses and spits of venom. How can we beat him? Or why can't we beat him? Continues Satan, we can't beat him because of his great power and uh, more curses. Though we have tried, we have not been able to beat his power. However, Satan continued, God is not impossible to wound. They grew quiet, wondering what Satan meant. God may be impossible to beat, but no, he is not impossible to wound. Why? Because of his great love. And though God might be invincible, those he loves are not. Thus, we will wound the father by going after his children. This was met with a roar of approval, sinister sneers, gleeful growls. What we need, my fellow enemies of God, is a temptation. A temptation so effective that it'll curse humans for millennia. And yet a temptation so harmless looking that humans will see it as only sensible. Now, as you know, God has infused this planet with many of his characteristics, like his wisdom. Boo, they shouted. His love, hiss. His kindness, more curses. And I believe, Satan continued, that we can use these characteristics, these parts of himself that God has infused into this world. I believe we can take hold of these things, tear them apart, and I believe we can create the master temptation 
taken all together, these overpower us. So tear them apart from each other. Rip them apart. See what you come up with. Create for me the master temptation. Disperse. So with a revengeful roar, the demons got to work. God had infused so much of himself into his creation that things to use were everywhere. Knowledge had been attached to love. So one demon decided to rip those apart and keep knowledge. And he discovered that knowledge without love is arrogance. Speaking of love, love had been attached to fairness. So another demon decided to rip love and fairness apart. And he discovered that love without fairness was favoritism. This left fairness. Fairness was attached to virtue. So the third demon ripped virtue off from fairness and discovered that fairness without virtue was envy. Now, there were only two humans that, you know, around at this time, but eventually they're going to have a couple sons, and incidentally, it was envy that was going to be used very effectively on their firstborn. His name was Cain, and, uh, and uh, it was so effective that envy was actually going to give birth to another sin called murder. But that's a story for another time. The fourth demon had watched the other demon rip virtue off from fairness. And so he decided to pick up virtue. It was attached to power. So he ripped those in two, and uh, he, he, he ripped virtue and power in two and let power fall to the ground. And he discovered that virtue without power was legalism. Another demon saw romance and decided to see what he could do with that. But romance was attached to loyalty. Ripped them apart and realized that Loyalty, or romance minus loyalty was a thing called adultery. Another demon picked up loyalty. He saw that it was attached to wisdom. So he tore wisdom off and he discovered that loyalty without wisdom was folly. Well, wisdom might be good for something, thought another demon. He picked up wisdom, found it was attached to kindness, ripped them apart and discovered that kindness, I'm sorry, that wisdom minus kindness made cruelty. Kindness. Well, another demon thought I could maybe do something with kindness, but kindness was attached to truth. What would happen if I detached truth from kindness? And he discovered that kindness without truth made indifference. And truth dropped to the floor. Some major discoveries, some powerful sins. And as the rest of the demons were off experimenting with their new temptations, a smaller demon, kind of timid, he decided finally he's going to step forward, see what he could find. And there on the ground were two pieces remaining that hadn't been used. They were power and truth. And not sure which of those he wanted. And since neither had been claimed, he picked both up and he started experimenting with them. He tried truth, first of all, without power. But it didn't create anything. He realized that truth is already so powerful that you can't really have truth without some kind of power. Now, then he tried power without truth. And uh, it didn't create anything. You know, uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was just pure power, pure intimidation, just kind of the might makes right, totalitarian stuff. And it was just so hideous, it was hard to imagine anybody ever being tempted by that. And the demon found out that truth without power didn't work. He found out that power without truth didn't work. And so he just sat one on top of the other and he walked away. But then he turned back because he noticed something about what he had just done. He had placed power on top of truth. And it suddenly hit him. I wonder what happens when power is over truth, twisting truth. So he went back and he picked them up. And and with power still over truth, he started turning truth under it twisting truth. And as he did it, the power just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And he realized he had just created a new temptation. Power twisting the truth to get more power, twisting the truth about God, twisting the truth about people so that the person gets more and more power. And it was such a unique and powerful uh, temptation that he knew it was going to be useful to Satan. And as he twisted truth, he started imagining the lies that could be told, lies to beat other people down, lies to wound people. Also, you get more power. I shall call it slander, he said. And then he had another thought. So what if I were to twist truth the other way? So he started to twist truth the other way. And instead of lies that beat people down, now he had lies that puffed people up. And the demon watched with astonishment as power just kept growing whichever way he twisted the truth. Twisting it this way, now he saw lies to make other people feel good. It will give me more power. I shall call this temptation flattery. 
the demon congratulated himself for by putting power over truth and then using power to twist the truth, he discovered two sins. Slander, lies that give me more power by tearing people down, and flattery, lies that give me more power by puffing people up. And then it came time for the demons to present their new temptations to Satan. And one by one, he commended them. Adultery looks promising. Cruelty, good job. Favoritism, we can use that. But nothing was quite the master temptation until the end of the line when the final demon introduced his two new temptations, slander and flattery. Power twisting the truth to get more power. And so the demon demonstrated how it worked, and he could see Satan's eyes light up. I could flatter the humans by making up slander against God. Perfect, said Satan. I know exactly what I shall do. So Satan took the two new temptations, shape-shifted into a beautiful serpent, and slithered away to try it out on the new humans. Truth. It's a precious treasure. A lot of people use truth as a power tool, twisting the truth to get more power, whether it be lies meant to beat somebody down, slander, or lies meant to puff somebody up, flattery, all with the goal of getting more power. We see it in politics all the time, right? Flattering your, your voters and slandering the opponent. Uh, we see it in business all the time, uh, puffing your potential buyer up and slandering the competition, Flattery and slander. Uh, For after the fall of Adam and Eve, the tools called flattery and slander were were released to the general public, especially useful to people addicted to power, Uh, especially guys like kings. Uh, You know, one of the kings of Israel, King Ahab, he was addicted to power, and it's really fascinating to see how Ahab, he wielded both uh, slander and flattery to get more power. Now, it's true that Israel had once been a nation that was committed to the truth, It was founded on God and his commandments. But most of the later kings in Israel in the Old Testament, you know, they really deviated from the truth of God and his commandments. And one of the things they did to get more and more power was to trade the worship of God for the worship of idols. Because it's like a whole lot easier to think highly of yourself when you've made your own God than when you have to acknowledge that God has made you. And that's... uh, And so uh, King Ahab, he traded, you know, the worship of God for worshiping the Canaanite storm god. Anybody know what his name was? Starts with a B. Yeah, Baal, Baal, yeah. Um, And so uh, so the uh, the the thing about being addicted to power is you never have enough, right? It's kind of like being addicted to stuff. Like you'll just never get enough stuff. And so uh, Ahab, he had a palace. He had, you know everything he wanted, all the land and stuff, but there was this really impressive vineyard that he saw close to the palace, and it belonged to a private citizen named Naboth. And uh, Ahab offered to buy it. Naboth said no. And so the, the Ahab administration, spearheaded by Ahab's wife, hired a couple of scoundrels to publicly accuse Naboth of something he didn't do, to get him kill, killed, and then Ahab would have the vineyard, and that's exactly what they did. And you remember, don't you, What it's called when you twist truth to beat people down and get more power is called what? Slander. Ahab is a master of slander. So anybody who questions him uh, gets lied about. Slanderous names. So, for example, the prophet Elijah, he's trying to steer the nation back to God. He's trying to do something good and listen to what Ahab calls Elijah. This is uh, 1 Kings 18, verse 17. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? making up names about him, and slander. So Ahab was a master of slander, but he wasn't just a master of slander, he was also a master of flattery. To be precise, he directed his slander towards his enemies. Um, he directed his flattery back toward himself through his hand-picked prophets. Um, so Ahab, he was going to attack a country uh, called Aram in the north, and uh, he, he went to his prophets, and he's like, okay, what are you... Should we attack him? What do you think? And the prophets are just like gushing their praise for Ahab. And I need someone to read this. Could I have somebody look up? Uh, we're going to look at like maybe uh, six, seven verses in First Kings chapter 22. Anybody want to raise your hand if you can do that for us? 
All right, in the back. Thanks so much. So this is 1 Kings chapter 22, and we'll start with verse 6. As soon as you got it, just shout it out. Ahab called about 400 prophets together and asked them, Should I go to war against Ramoth and Gilead or not? He answered, Go, because the Lord will hand them over to you. But Jehoshaphat asked, Isn't there a prophet of the Lord here? Let's ask him what we should do. Awesome. Let's get down to verse 11 and 12. Zedekiah, son of Canaanah, uh, had made some iron forms. He said to Ahab, this is what the Lord says, you will use these forms to fight the Arameans until they are destroyed. All yes. the other prophets said the same thing. Attack Ramoth and Gilead and win, because the Lord will hand the Arameans over to you. Perfect. Now what is that called? These 400 prophets, what are they doing to Ahab? What is it? Flattery. That's exactly right. Oh, Ahab, of course you're going to be victorious because you're awesome. This is what happens when truth becomes a slave of power. It becomes really pathetic. Because if you keep reading, these 400 or so prophets are dead wrong, with an emphasis on the word dead. Because Ahab and his army, they're going to go up and they're going to fight against Aram, and they're going to fail miserably, and Ahab's going to get killed. As you recall, what was it that caused Naboth's death? Starts with an S. Slander, what was it that causes Ahab's death? These are serious, serious sins here, uh, which makes me ask you, okay, all right, let's pause. You, which do you care more about, truth or power? And this has everything to do with you and your life. Um, it, for example, politics, okay? Do, do you care more that the person you vote for tells the truth or just that the person you vote for will keep your group in power. Uh, work, you know, at work, do you care more about being a person that people can trust, or do you care more about getting that sale at whatever cost, or getting that promotion at whatever cost? It has to do with friendships, you know. Have you noticed, I hate this, but have you noticed that sometimes to be liked by a certain group of people, you have to talk bad about another group of people? You have to flatter one group by slandering another? So do you care more about truth when you're with your friends, or do you care more about the power of popularity? It has everything to do with your faith. Are we willing to tell somebody about Jesus, even if no one else in the workplace does that, and it may make you look a little strange, do you care about your friend's soul more, or are you more concerned about blending in, fitting in, looking cool, preserving your position? Again, question that we all have to wrestle with here is, is this. Do you care more about truth or about power? Do you, do you care more about truth or about protecting your image? Truth teller or a lover of power? So King Ahab, he has some like 400 prophets and, and uh, you know, I doubt he knew the names of any of them. But he did know the name of one prophet uh, who wasn't really part of the 400. Just one and this was the guy that was willing to say the stuff that, that, that uh, Ahab didn't want to hear. Now, uh, what Ahab didn't want to hear had a name. It was called Truth. And this prophet's name was Micaiah. I have a nephew named Micaiah, which is a great name. He's one of the greatest guys in the Bible. And, and so for his attack uh, on Aram, King Ahab, he's going he's gonna to bring in another king called King Jehoshaphat. So Ahab's the king of the north, uh, the, king, the king of Israel. Jehoshaphat's in the south of Judah. And uh, anyway, so they're going to join together. They're going to attack Aram. And so they're making plans for war. And King Jehoshaphat, who he actually believes in God, he says to King Ahab, he's like, let's pause for a second. Let's make sure this is what God wants us to do. And so that's when Ahab calls his prophets. To think, and, and they're like, yeah, yeah, okay. You, yeah, go for it. You're going to do great. And uh, Jehoshaphat, he can tell that they're just flattering Ahab. They're more concerned with power than with the truth. And so King Jehoshaphat, he's like, we really need to see if there's an actual prophet of God here. And here's what Ahab says. He says, well, okay, there is one prophet through whom we can inquire of the Lord, but, and this is straight from the Bible, he says, but I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me, but always bad. He is Micaiah, son of Imla. So King Ahab grudgingly sends for Micaiah. He's like, go get him. But I'm telling you, he's just going to say no. Micaiah comes in. 
he, he gives us prophecy. He, he, it takes him a while to get to it, but, but when they're finally, okay, tell us what, what are you thinking? Micaiah says, I saw all of Israel scattered like sheep without a shepherd. In other words, your king is going to die. And, uh, and Ahab's like, see, I told you. He tells us stuff like this. And, uh, and then could you, in the back, could you read us uh, verse 26 to 28? Everyone listen here to verse 26 to 28. The king of Israel then ordered to take Micaiah and send him back to Ammon, the ruler of that city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, This is what the king says. Put this fellow in prison and give him nothing but bread and water until I return safely. Micaiah said, If you ever return safely, the Lord has not spoken through me. Then he added, Mark my words. Oh, yeah. Thanks. When faced with a choice between power and truth, and, and we're all going to be faced with that choice, uh, Micaiah, he chose truth, and his fellow prophets chose what? Power, and yet, even though 400 prophets chose power over truth, listen to me, all together, all 400 of those prophets didn't have the, the power that Micaiah wielded. As a follower of Christ, when you choose to value truth over power, when you choose to tell the truth and live the truth, th- listen, nothing is more powerful. Um, I got a story I want to share, but how much time do I have? What? All right. All right. Very good. All right. So uh, it's in the novel 1984, um, written in 1949 by George Orwell. It's about big brother government controlling everything about everybody's life, and even, even controlling what people think and believe, and no freedom at all. And the novel centers on uh, Winston and Julia. These are two citizens of this totalitarian regime, and they've had enough of Big Brother. They're ready for freedom, and uh, they dream of freedom, but they're just not sure how they can get it. They're not sure who they can trust, but they think they can trust a guy named O'Brien, who's a, he's an officer or an official. So they secretly go to O'Brien, and it turns out, sure enough, O'Brien He's part of the resistance, and so he asks Winston and Julia some questions to just kind of make sure that they're on board. He says, so are you prepared to give your lives? They say, yes. Are you prepared to commit murder? Yes. To commit acts of sabotage, which could cause the death of hundreds of innocent people? Yes. Again, all, in the, all for the resistance. Are you willing to do these things? Are you prepared to cheat, to forge, to blackmail, to corrupt the minds of children, to distribute habit-forming drugs, to do anything which is likely to cause demoralization and weaken the power of the party? Yes. If, for example, it would serve our interests to throw sulfuric acid in a child's face, are you prepared to do that? Yes. By the end of the questions, Winston and Julia are officially a part of the resistance, part of the secret group that they're going to overthrow Big Brother O'Brien then dismisses them and lets them know that they'll hear from him soon. And they do, because shortly thereafter, Winston and Julia are arrested. They've been discovered. It got found out that they were trying to overthrow Big Brother. And how did the authorities find out? The answer is O'Brien. O'Brien was never part of the resistance. O'Brien was just a very clever official for Big Brother. And after Winston was arrested, it was O'Brien who's put in charge of Winston's interrogation and torture. And so... Uh, during one of the conversations, Winston, he's, he's weak, but he's trying to convince O'Brien that Winston is right and the big brother is, 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 is evil. And so O'Brien says, okay, you consider yourself morally superior to us with our lies and our cruelty? Yes, I do. I consider myself superior. Without saying a word, O'Brien starts playing a recording, a recording that Winston instantly remembers are you prepared to commit murder? Yeah. Commit acts of sabotage may cause the death of hundreds of people? Yeah. Cheat, forge, blackmail, corrupt? Yeah. Acid? Yeah. And Winston realized that with all those yeses, he'd lost all credibility. Listen, as a follower of Christ, you say you're on the side of truth. Are you willing, though, to cheat on your taxes? Are you willing to lie to get the sale? Are, are you willing to talk bad about one person so you can look cool to another person? Are you willing to hide or, or even, even lose your Christian beliefs in order to fit in? Listen, when we twist truth to get more power, we lose all credibility. It makes our faith look like a sham. Would you commit to valuing truth over power? 
I'll just end by saying this. The great irony is that when you do value truth over power and you follow the truth, even if it costs you, and it will, there's nothing more powerful. Ephesians 4, but speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Let's pray. So God, we want to be people who value the truth and that we we love it, we live it, we teach it, we practice it, and, uh, and we just pray that we would value truth over power. The culture can have what it wants. We, we want your truth. We want to seek your kingdom. We want to seek your righteousness. And we want on that day for you to say, well done. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name.